Has it got the book of opinions? <laughs> All right, we're getting started. There we go. All right, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 15 this morning. And uh, end, up in end up in Hebrews chapter 6. So we start this morning. Genesis chapter 15. Yeah. Genesis chapter 14, I know everybody remembers just off the top of their head that Genesis chapter 14 is where um, Abram was about to sacrifice Isaac. And God said, don't do it, and I'll provide myself a sacrifice. So that's what happened there. So then we're getting into barrel chip of speed. Now we're getting into chapter 15 of Genesis. Says, After these things, the word of the Lord, and that's, look at that, that's all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps means God the Father. The word, which is Jesus, the word, came of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, in the days that we're in right now, the way things, everybody's worried about everything. You're worried about COVID. You're worried about the election. You're worried about who's going to be where, what, why. We need to take heed of what God told Abram on that too. And uh, understand that he is our shield and our exceeding great reward. Our reward is our salvation in, in, in Christ Jesus. Our reward is to be with, with the Father in heaven Amen. and have, have a great glory there. That's our reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? So, you know, God, I've, I've heard you and I've believed you all this time, but can you give me something? Can you give me a little little extra something to cure my unbelief? You remember the one said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief? That's kind of what Abram's doing right here. He's like, Lord, I believe, but can you help my unbelief? Because this is getting hard after all this time. It's, you know, I believed you and I believed you, but it's really getting hard for me to believe because it looks bad. And that's where I think a lot of Christians are throughout our lives. I believe you, Lord, but it looks bad. Can you help me? It says, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowel shall be thine heir. He said, out of your own body, out of your own physical system is going to come your heir, out of your own seed. I'm not giving you an heir out of somebody else's and out of the law, but I'm giving you an heir directly out of your own body. And verse five says, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward the heaven and tell the, tell the stars if thou be able to number them and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So God tells him, tells him look up into the, into the stars and tell me how many they are. Lord, I can't. That's how many of your seed they're going to be. So just, I think, paraphrasing, God says, relax, I got this. And Abram, Abram's going, but Lord, I can't see it. And so many times we're just like that. God says, I've got this. And but Lord, I can't see it. Can you give me a sign? Can you help me understand? Verse six says, and he believed in the Lord. That's L-O-R capitals. That's God the Father. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abram's faith saved him. Amen. It was no sacrifice. It wasn't his work that carried Isaac and his availability to put him on the altar. His full faith in God and God taking God at his word. That's what salvation is, taking God at his word, that salvation is complete through Jesus and that we can't do anything about it. We have to put our faith and trust in him and his completed work and call on his name to be saved. That's where it's at. And he, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Lord, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's kind of what he's saying again. 
how can I know? I believe you, but how can I know? How can I settle my flesh? My mind is running crazy. All of these things are going through that's dragging me off, making me not want to believe. And then he said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the, bir but the birds he divided not. So he cut these into pieces and laid them down, laid them out in two lines. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto, and he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now this was before the Egyptian deal, before Joseph, before all of this happened being predicted, God's telling it Abram that it's going to happen. But now back to these, let's just break down for a second. Why did he cut up these beasts and these and put these birds out? Why were they dead and cut up and in a line on each side? Now, way back then, that was one of the con way of doing a contract between two people. They would lay out carcasses like this and they would walk back and forth between them, quoting the contract together. And it's saying in this contract, may we, may I be as these beasts cut up and dead or worse if I don't fulfill my portion of the contract. So this is a contract. This is the way that the contract between two people was done. They walked back and forth between this carnage, quoting the contract. And this is God giving a promise in a con or a contract to Abram. So let's get back to what all it's going to be, that what all's involved in it. Verse 14 says, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And whenever I was reading that about the iniquity of the Amorites are not yet full, and I was reading online, somebody asking the question, why has God not judged America and dealt with it harshly and brought it down because of all of the sin and the things going on? And then I was reading this, and it's like, you know, America's sin is not yet full. God knows when. And for those second-guessing and worrying about when God's going to bring down America, God knows when a sin is full. He knows when he's had enough of it, whenever it's time to blow the whistle and the game is over, whenever the time clock is run out. So for those that are worrying about why God hasn't judged America and when God's going to judge America, know that God knows when he's going to do any of that. God knows when and he's going to take care of that. So quit fretting yourself. Know that God's your shield. He's your buckler. He's your great reward. America's not your great reward. It's just a vessel that pass our time until we go to our Lord. I did chase a rabbit, didn't I? All right, let's see. And verse 18 says, in the, same, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites and the Amorites, and... wait a minute, I missed a spot. <clears throat> back to verse 16 but in the fourth generation they came hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full verse 17 and it came to pass when the sun went down it was dark behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces now God himself passed between the pieces God because he could swear by no greater he swore upon himself Okay, you see that? God swore upon himself. So unless God's salvation, God's promises 
will only be untrue if God is no more. Well, folks have tried to kill and stamp out and put God down and put him out ever since man started almost. They ain't killed God yet. You remember back in the 70s, they said, God's dead. He started all this, but then he died. No. God swore by himself. His covenants are real. The smoking furnace and the burning lamp. You remember whenever God was leading the Israelites, he would have a fire and a pillar of cloud and smoke. God's signs of himself being there. So in case anybody wonders if they think I'm off base, research it really good. I challenge you. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Under thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenzanites, and the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Pezzarites, and the Rephims, the Amorites, and it just goes on and on. Everybody that's there is going to have to go because God's people are coming in. And let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 as we continue on. There's another spot in Genesis where it says, um, and we'll look at it in Hebrews because it quotes it, Abraham trusted God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. We look at chapter 6 of Hebrews, starting at verse 9. Hebrews 6, starting at verse 9. It says, um, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Remember, he was taught chapter 5 and the first part of 6 about folks stepping out of the doctrine and folks trying to work their way to heaven and all sorts of things that apostate teachings. And he says, even though we talk rough about that stuff, we expect better of you. We know that you know better. And the things company salvation, though we thus speak, verse 10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. What does that mean? He's not unrighteous to forget. Now, some folks, if they've been working hard and they get caught, in, caught up in sin, and they get punished. They're like, well, Lord, why didn't you do that to me? I've worked so hard for you. He's reminding them again, your work is kind of expected. And your sin will be punished. Yours, mine, anybody's. So we don't need to think that we're going to get off scot-free just because we are worked so hard for God. Did we really work so hard for God or did we work so hard because our conscience was bothering us and we thought that we would get by with something? We need to understand that we have a just God. He's a merciful God, but he's a just God. And he is our salvation. And no matter how hard we work, we can lose our rewards. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Keep striving and keep working because we're going to fail at times. We're going to be feel slapped around. We're going to be in despair at times. We're going to be hopeless at times. We're going to feel like we're completely beat, like Abram did. Lord, help my unbelief. Can you show me, Lord? Can you help me understand? Can you give me a little more? Can you give me a little more substance to help me through the hard times? And I think... You know, sometimes we just, like Abram, be honest with God. God, I believe you, but help me. Can you give me a little bit more to show me that it's going to be okay? Sometimes we just sit around in despair and think, well, you don't challenge God. Well, no, you don't. That's dumb. There's a difference in asking God's help and challenging God. 
there's a difference in pleading with God. And like some people say, and I hate to even say it, praying in power, they call it or something, kind of like they're going to boss God around. Got much to say about that. We can come boldly and humbly to the throne of grace, boldly knowing that we're not going to be thrown out, humbly knowing that he is God and we're not. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. God swore on his own self that his promises are true, promises of salvation, a redeemer through the lineage of Abraham, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. Do you know that we as Christians are spiritual seeds of Abram, of Abraham, that we are part of his promise, that our salvation is complete. He is, he is our hope. That hope is that blessed hope, that truth that will, that will get you there. Not the guessing hope, the blessed hope. There's a huge difference. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham, Abraham patiently endured. How many of us as good Americans patiently endure? How many of you stood in front of the coffee pot or the microwave yelling, hurry up? You patiently endure it. We have a bad problem with it, don't we? Patiently endure it. God has... Patient, give me some patiently enduring and trying to build a business for since 2009. I've been almost five years behind where I thought I should be the whole time. But I'm entrusting God because he's been leading me. I, I think the whole time I've been trying to follow him. You know, sometimes I might follow my own ways and get slapped down. But patiently enduring, waiting for the promise, not that we don't continue to work and try to do what we're supposed to do because I think that's clear. We're not working for our salvation or we're not working for God's approval. We're working because what God said to do. And we're trying and we're, where Paul says in one spot, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean working for your salvation. That means working to get everything you can out of your salvation. Working to get the peace and the hope and the joy as much as possible and to share it with other people. Verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs the promise of the immutab the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath. You know what that immutability means? Not, not to be transferred. It is fixed. It's unalterable. God's promise is unalterable. His salvation is unalterable. It's fixed. Confirmed by God's own oath. His promise of salvation. His salvation relies on him. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Christ is a refuge. God is a refuge. God in Christ is our refuge. He is our hope that we hold to. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Where is your soul anchored? Is it anchored in Jesus Christ? Or is it anchored in your ability to say, God, forgive me, and to remember every sin you ever did? Both sure and steadfast, and which endureth into that within the veil. So how deep is God's love? How sure is his salvation? Only as sure as God himself. So if you can't believe in God, you can't believe in salvation. If you can't believe that he can love you enough to save you, to do it himself, you can't be saved. 
hard to believe that he would love me that much. That's the biggest thing, I think, between people. Don't have any trouble believing, look at all this greatness that God exists, but why would he care about me? Because you have all of these religions telling you how mean and hateful their God is. Those are demons, most of them. They're not a true and a living and a loving God that would actually go to the trouble to save his own creation. Whether the forerunner is for us, entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's making intercession for you and me. Intercession. He's the only one to make intercession for you and me. And the propitiation. Yeah, the propitiation for sin. He said clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And Jesus Christ is the only name given by which men must be saved. The only way to be saved is to believe in your heart that he did what he said he did. God in flesh came to pay the price for sin. Believe it, own it all the way through and call on his name. Jesus, save me because I know there's no other way. Forgive me for my evil ways and save me and help me to be in your hands and not mine. And that's the only way to be saved. It says clearly in Romans 10. And I'm going to stop right there for the sake of time and for, because we, let's see. Because there's some other stuff and some deep things that I don't want to get into in chapter seven until we got more time to spend on it. But I think that's, that's very clear how all of that, you know, if you're a New Testament Christian, how can you be without the Old Testament? It all fits together. It blends together. One touches the other. It's like, you know, I'm only sitting on one leg of a chair. It ain't going to hold very good. Just remember, Jesus loves you. He came, to, he came to save you if he hasn't already saved you. He still came to save you. Hope that makes sense and helps somebody.